From the twisted minds of Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and Jonah Hill comes an animated film about food. And no, we're not talking about a cooking show. Sausage Party is set to turn the animated film genre on its head with an R rating, adult humor, language, and food-related sexual innuendos. Join us on a trip to the supermarket as we go through our 107 facts about Sausage Party. Let's get started. I'm gonna fix you. <laughs> Number 1. Sausage Party is an adult animated comedy written by Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and Jonah Hill. The film features a surprisingly filthy, very R-rated script disguised as a fun and colorful children's blockbuster. Number 2. Sausage Party is being directed by Greg Tiernan and Conrad Vernon, both of which are known for their work on many big-name animations. Greg had his hand in directing Thomas the Tank Engine, while Conrad is an accomplished DreamWorks director for movies like Shrek 2, Monsters vs. Aliens, and Madagascar 3. Number 3. Sausage Party recruited a great voice cast, featuring many renowned comedic actors. The lineup includes Rogan and Franco, Michael Cera, Selma Hayek, Kristen Wiig, Paul Rudd, Bill Hader, Jonah Hill, and many more. Number 4. The film centers around a hot dog named Frank, played by Seth Rogen, who realizes their entire ideology about the afterlife is a lie. Once he learns about the terrible truth about what happens after a customer takes the groceries home, Frank and his food friends devise a plan to escape their human enemies. Number 5. According to Seth Rogen, the the birth of this idea ironically came from a pretty innocent place. It was brought up while discussing his love for animated films and what the writers have observed from these childhood classics over the years. Number 6. While feeling creatively restrained working on The Green Hornet, the writers thought it would be hilarious if there was an R-rated Pixar movie. As if to play along with the joke, they suddenly started hashing one out for fun. Number 7. The creators always joked about making a movie called Sausage Party. One day, they finally explored the possibilities to back up the title, and that was how the project was born. Born. Number 8. To continue the joke, whenever press would ask about their next project in the works, Seth Rogen and friends would respond with, Sausage Party. The ongoing gag never ceased to get a laugh. Number 9. Although the name was absolutely ridiculous, it still seemed believable as something they would produce. So the team pieced together a story to match the title, which at first started out a little generic. The initial idea just centered around a group of guys, hence the name Sausage Party. Number 10. You can thank Jonah Hill for your main characters being sausages, as he was the one that suggested the characters be literal sausages. This idea is what sparked the main inspiration for the story, and after that, the film quickly became their passion project. Number 11. The creative team was immediately in favor of making the story about actual sausages. They felt that the metaphor was very in-your-face, and that made the story more interesting as opposed to the original idea, which was straightforward, but a little mundane. Number 12. The key observation the writers gathered from most Pixar films was its routine to personify random objects as though they were people, so they simply applied that ideology towards food and center the story around it. Number 13. Just going to point out that sausages in the movie aren't sausages at all. They're actually all American Franks. They refer to them as sausages instead of hot dogs, so the joke of the title would work. Hey, would you like some sausages? Number 14. It didn't take much to enlist the help of fellow writers Kyle Hunter and Ariel Schaefer, both known for their collaboration on previous projects with Seth and Evan, such as This Is The End and The Night Before. They pitched it as an animated super bad of sorts and the two were happy to oblige their friends. Number 15. Kyle Hunter commented on their partnership with Seth and Evan by saying it felt more like friends helping friends rather than a professional collaboration. Starting out, they worked backwards from the immature points, which is all they had at the time, until they finally began to develop a solid movie. Number 16. Despite maybe a few minor voice acting roles, none of the crew had any previous experience in animation other than the two directors, which is exactly why Seth Rogen and the gang looked to enlist seasoned animators in the first place. Number 17. Conrad Vernon actually met Seth while working on Monsters vs. Aliens, so naturally he came to mind when the writers were looking to recruit animation experience. Seth invited Conrad over to his house, and after about an hour or so of partying, they pitched him one of the craziest ideas he'd ever heard. Number 18. Not only is Conrad a seasoned animation director, but he also has voice acting experience. He was the voice of the adorably handicapped gingerbread man from the Shrek franchise. Number 19. While pitching the project, the guys definitely put their right foot foot forward, so to speak, and hooked people right off the bat with the insanity that was the logline. Then, after they had their attention, they got into the theological discussion about the script's true existential undertones. Number 20. Director Conrad said that he was in from the start of the pitch. Making an R-rated cartoon was something that he had wanted to do since he saw Heavy Metal when he was 13. He thanks the writers for actually making that dream a reality. Number 21. Greg Tiernan had a similar experience, only it took him even less time to get on board. Greg jokes that all he had to hear was 
because it involved sausages making love to buns, and he couldn't wait to get started. Number 22. Sausage Party couldn't be a more perfect reunion for directors Conrad and Greg. That's right, the two have worked together before, as they met on the set of Ralph Bakshi's Cool World, another risque, semi-animated film. Number 23. It was actually Conrad Vernon who had requested help from Greg Tiernan. Turns out, the two used to draw absolutely filthy Charlie Brown cartoons for one another. Number 24. The directors believe their experience in developing animated films was exactly what the project needed to ensure its success. They were happy to get involved with an R-rated picture because they had more creative leeway than ever before. Number 25. The filmmakers aren't kidding when they mention their freedom and creative control over the project. The only content that was denied were the jokes that they didn't get a laugh at, but all the other ideas were fair game. Number 26. The biggest challenge of making the film was trying not to be too gratuitous. The filmmakers wanted a good story with really good characters rather than one crude joke after the next. Number 27. Seth Rogen describes the movie as an R-rated Toy Story, only with food instead of dolls. Much like the Pixar classic, the original setup involved food coming to life after the humans left. Number 28. As ridiculous as it may sound, a lot of time went into character development to ensure audiences would relate to these food products. The filmmakers joke that we'll never want to eat food again. Number 29. Seth and Evan may be known for crude humor and violence, but many attest to their writing capabilities. Conrad Vernon claims that the character development is what they do best, and despite how outrageous the story may be, the audience will still care for the outcome of the story. Number 30. The filmmakers didn't approach the project as they would with a regular animated film. Instead, they considered this film to be more like a live-action picture that just so happens to be animated. Number 31. The screenplay has been rewritten more times than they could keep track. Early versions of the script had our characters contained solely within the grocery store rather than just trying to find a way back to their shelf. Number 32. Another big change that was made involved the main protagonist. Early interviews about the project reveal that Michael Sarah's character, Barry the Hot Dog, was originally supposed to take the lead. Number 33. A major plot point in this film is this great beyond, where food believes it will go once it leaves the grocery store. Every type of food believes something different happens once they are purchased and taken home by a human. Hmm. That sounds familiar. Number 34. Humans are looked at as gods by all food in the grocery store. The foods hope to be chosen and taken to the great beyond by these glorious gods as previewed in the trailer. Number 35. All of the hot dogs in the grocery store share a similar belief system. They believe that in the great beyond, they are finally able to hook up with the buns they are located across the aisle from. Number 36. In early versions of the script, the food never leaves the grocery store, but instead, they are lost within it. The plot centered around their journey finding their way back to the shelves before the big 4th of July sale, so they could be purchased and find their way to the great beyond. Number 37. Contrary to popular belief, this film is meant to have a lot of heart and substance. The filmmakers knew it would be impossible to carry an audience if the film had nothing more than filthy punchlines and profanity, so the overall message is actually pretty profound. The subject matter is inherently about religion, and therefore it's edgy from the start. Maybe we'll learn a thing or two. Number 38. As far as the MPAA was concerned, the really inappropriate adult content that takes place between the food objects was passable for an R rating. There wasn't a lot they said no to, but their script notes on the matter were apparently hilarious and memorable to the crew. Number 39. Apparently, there are no holds barred when it comes to the content of the screenplay. Aside from the heavy adult language, there's violence and even creepy inter-food relations too. Number 40. Yes, food gets very intimate in this movie. The only line that the filmmakers couldn't cross was getting people involved in that activity, but that didn't stop them from trying and earlier drafts. Number 41. The film purposefully stereotypes every culture into food as part of the overall joke. The creators took a cinematic approach of portraying these characters by using outdated iconic film references as their inspiration. Number 42. The film has been in the works for about eight years. Number 43. Production for the movie didn't officially kick off until three or four years ago, around 2013. Up until that point, it was a never-ending process of rewrites and pitching until Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg partnered with Megan Ellison, who finally finally got the wheels in motion. Number 44. For the writers, a challenge they faced during the scripting process was making sure the film was grounded in some sort of emotional reality. It was challenging to create the right subtext for every scene so that it was never just food talking about being food. Number 45. This movie was hands down a refreshing change for veteran cartoonists. Because they were all getting paid to draw filthy material, they didn't have to worry about having to answer to HR afterwards. Number 46. Daily production meetings took place at 9 a.m every morning. These meetings mostly consisted of important discussion topics related to the film, such as whether or not the cheese wedge should have a nipple ring. Hmm. 
but wouldn't that just be a cheese ring? Number 47. At a certain point, the filmmakers came to the realization that the animation quality had to be on par with Pixar. As a result, the film has been in production for several years now, just to give it enough technical polish to pass for a modern animated blockbuster. Number 48. The filmmakers chose Toy Story to be a reference for both animation style and story because it had a very specific look that audiences would immediately recognize. So the film is literally meant to be nostalgic in a sense for the sake of humor. Number 49. Evan Goldberg stated that for a while it was rated NC-17. They did their best to tone it down just enough for the R rating, but he claims the film is definitely still pushing it. Number 50. Taking the animated approach helped the concept find itself more organically for several reasons. This allowed the writers to be more edgy and daring with the content, as well as allowing the voice actors to cut loose and have more fun with the characters. Number 51. Seth Rogen has a very positive outlook on the struggles of producing one of the biggest animated comedies. He's happy that some of his films aren't easily figured out, and because of that, not all of his films are produced right off the bat. Number 52. Shockingly, the very controversial film The Interview was much easier to get financed than Sausage Party. The production process was the exact opposite of the animated film. As soon as they had the idea for the interview, the studio bought it, whereas Sausage Party took years to pull off. Number 53. During the entire production process, financing became the absolute biggest challenge the filmmakers faced. As exciting as it was for them to produce a film of this nature, it was equally terrifying for studios to want to invest in it. Number 54. Not having another R-rated animation to use as a reference was the exact reason financing became such an issue. Financers looked at producing the film as though it were a huge risk because of the unknown territory. Number 55. Not having a business model to draw from made it difficult to find a studio backing for the project. However, one of the biggest selling points was the talented cast the filmmakers recruited. Number 56. While the cast is comedy heavy, it still contains a very diverse set of acting chops. And luckily enough, each cast member joined for a different reason, whether it be someone recruiting or just a general curiosity about the film. Number 57. Edward Norton is actually good friends with Selma Hayek. He's the one who convinced her to join the cast as Teresa Taco. Number 58. It seems as though Craig Robinson was a later addition to the cast. Mostly everyone else had already been signed on or assigned a character when Seth Rogen announced Craig would be joining the cast. Number 59. Aside from the shocking realization and existential crisis, the movie does have a villain. Nick Kroll is cast to play the main bad guy named Douche, who also happens to be a douche. Number 60. Bill Hader is cast as a couple of characters in the film. He plays both Guacamole and Firewall who's an old boozy shaman of sorts. Number 61. Selma Hayek describes the character of Teresa Taco as one naughty, naughty taco. Selma still jokes that she has no idea how she was talked into doing the movie. As she was so shocked during the initial pitch, she claims that it must have been hypnotism on their part. Number 62. Selma claims that Sausage Party is the dirtiest film she has ever done. When her husband first saw the trailer, he was in disbelief. And apparently that was only the Green Band version. Number 63. Selma still can't believe she said Said that many of her lines out loud. On the upside, she claims to have had an amazingly fun time working with Seth, and will most likely do it again sometime in the future. Number 64. Comedian Kristen Wiig plays the main bun named Brenda, and love interest to Seth Rogen's character, Frank. The American actress and producer is known for her work on SNL as well as comedy features such as Bridesmaids and the upcoming Ghostbusters reboot. Number 65. Workaholics co-star Andres Holm will be featured in the picture. Andres is reportedly playing one of the fellow hot dogs named Troy alongside the main ensemble cast. Number 66. There was an extra level of comfort between the cast and crew during production. While everyone has worked together at some point and being able to act alone in a recording booth, everyone was able to have fun contributing to the picture in their own way. Number 67. No one actually told Edward Norton to use a Woody Allen impression. It was his own creative take. Number 68. He perfected the impression after working with Woody on the set of Everyone Says I Love You and thought it would be hilarious to fool the audience. Number 69. Craig Robinson's original Original character was Uncle Ben's Rice. Needless to say, they changed the character, but the idea still makes the entire creative team almost cry from laughter. Number 70. There was a lot of improv that took place during every recording session. The directors would often throw out lines to create authentic banter for the characters. Number 71. There were at least six people in the recording studio at any given time. Aside from the voice actor, both directors as well as the four writers were present during every recording session. Number 72. The filmmakers credit the actors for taking the characters and really putting life into their food. Before the actors added their own unique take onto the characters, they were actually pretty stereotypical and generic to start. Number 73. Animation is not only expensive, but it apparently goes according to cost per minute. So the movie will only be about 80 to 90 minutes long. Luckily, the animators at Nitrogen Studio
Studios are bent on delivering Toy Story 3 level animation at the very least. Number 74. A typical Pixar film would cost upwards of $100 million, but Sausage Party is being produced for less than $20 million. Although the budget is low, the filmmakers promise to stun audiences with high quality animation, as one would expect from a DreamWorks or Disney Pixar film. Number 75. When asked about the possibility of a video game, none of the filmmakers were opposed to it in the least. Seth Rogen was actually very open to the idea and didn't discredit the possibility, but instead jokingly stated it would probably happen after another four years. Number 76. There's possibly an unintentional reference to the first Spider-Man movie during a scene containing ladles. This wasn't planned, but some audience members couldn't help but make the connection, and Seth was happy to oblige the idea. Number 77. In the eyes of many studios, there was very little precedence for the film to be made. For one reason, it contains an awful lot of food porn, and not the kind that people like to post on Instagram. Number 78. What sets this movie aside from other animated projects is hands down the fact that it's rated R, and apparently the screenplay takes full advantage of that. The directors even testified that the script can get rather shocking, but at the end of the day, the story might actually surprise you with its depth. Number 79. However unsettling the script may seem, the film actually gets really philosophical and deep. Overall, the plot is really about questioning the truth of our own existence, and what comes next. Number 80. Director Conrad Vernon explains the film's overall message is simply, live in the now. In his opinion, that very profound message will resonate with audiences and carry this film to success. Number 81. Sausage Party has been described as annihilating the boundaries of cinema, and that's mostly because of its setup. As producers Evan Goldberg and James Weaver describe it, no one knows exactly what to expect from this film, unlike most comedies where you may be able to guess based on the plot. Number 82. Many audiences couldn't be more excited for their first R-rated 3D animated comedy. Sausage Party has even been referred to as this generation's heavy metal. Number 83. Producer Evan Goldberg feels like Sausage Party will be a bigger success than many of their previous films. While movies like This Is The End may alienate certain audiences, the Sausage Party concept is far more universal because Disney and Pixar films are so popular. Number 84. Speaking of Pixar, a theater accidentally showed the R-rated Sausage Party preview at a Finding Dory screening full of parents and children to accommodate several large last-minute groups wanting to see Finding Dory during its opening weekend. One hard-working manager clicked the wrong movie. Won't somebody please think of the children? Seth Rogen later tweeted about the incident, saying, This made my day. Nobody knows that they saw it, but they did. Number 85. The filmmakers also feel the adults-only animated comedy will find success solely in it being the first film to mock such a wide platform. The writers took all the classic conventions of children's stories and made them wildly disgusting for our enjoyment. Number 86. Seth Rogen and his comedy team have been known for pushing the envelope and making edgier content such as This Is The End or The Interview. So far, audiences have responded well to the material, and the creative team believes it's because they typically have more fun producing the crazier projects. Number 87. The the creative team behind Sausage Party considers the idea to be oddly innovative. Up until this point, the crazier their ideas have been, the more positive the results are from the public. And they couldn't be happier with that realization. Number 88. Conrad Vernon and Greg Tiernan would love for projects like Sausage Party to catch on as a regular thing. Not just for the R-rated factor, but more sophisticated stories for animation in general. Number 89. Seth Rogen can barely get through an interview about Sausage Party without laughing. Even he finds it rather shocking that they were able to get a picture made to despite such graphic content. And that's really saying something considering he's one of the creators. Number 90. Seth Rogen refers to the film as being one of the filthiest and funniest things he has ever seen in his life. He credits the movie's producer and financer, Megan Ellison, for even making it possible. Number 91. Greg Tiernan guarantees this movie will get absolute huge laughs, but there are also a lot of heartfelt scenes that could cause audiences to tear up. That may sound weird considering what's been revealed about the film so far, but the filmmakers promise the story won't disappoint. Number 92. The movie actually shocked Sacha Baron Cohen. Seth Rogen screened an early hand-drawn version of the film to Sacha, who responded by saying the film is successful enough to be the craziest thing he's ever seen in his entire career. Number 93. Sausage Party had its debut alongside Key and Peele's Keanu at the South by Southwest Film Festival. Both films were dubbed a work in progress, although Seth Rogen was a lot more aggressive in emphasizing the fact that it was far from finished at that point. Number 94. The very first private screening was held in New York City back in 2005. 14. The entire film was only hand-drawn at that time. Number 95. Sausage Party had its world premiere about a year and a half after its first screening at the 2016 South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. Seth Rogen was particularly enthusiastic about the film festival because it's the only one that really headlines comedies. Number 96. On the other hand, even though director Conrad Vernon's parents moved to Austin, Texas 
about 20 years ago, the director still had never been to an SXSW film festival. He couldn't have been more excited to premiere his latest film there because it was truly a passion project. Number 97. The audience for the South by Southwest Film Festival were ecstatic by the end of the world premiere, giving the film an extremely positive response. Seth Rogen then kicked off a Q&A by saying they could all attend the group therapy together. Number 98. Craig Robinson's first time actually viewing the film was at the South by Southwest Film Festival. Afterwards, he said he honestly couldn't be happier with the results. Number 99. After the official first premiere, the film still needed about a full month's worth of animating before it could be completed, and additionally, two months for lighting afterwards. Once the picture itself was polished, then it was handed over to Alan Menken to complete the score. Number 100. To play into the family fun vibe, the film opens on a real Alan Menken musical number. Menken is an American composer best known for producing scores for some of the most famous Walt Disney productions, such as Aladdin or The Little Mermaid. Number 101. Many audience members at the screening were curious if Sausage Party broke any records for the most curse words used in a film. That category is a little fuzzy, but the film does hold its own inappropriate record when it comes to food-related sex jokes. Number 102. The film is often considered to be a tainted version of other similar concepts, such as Toy Story. One of the most common comparisons made is that the film reminds people of VeggieTales gone horribly wrong. Number 103. It's unclear exactly how much the plot has been changed since the South by Southwest Festival, but it stands to be quite a bit. It seems the inciting incident has changed from one item being returned, to the shelves with a horror story, to the food products witnessing the shocking reality for themselves. Number 104. Like many other trailblazing pictures, Sausage Party's marketing has been mostly online. They even have a brilliant viral ad campaign featuring hilarious reaction videos from numerous people watching the trailer. Number 105. During the premiere of his new show, Preacher, a new TV spot for Sausage Party aired featuring Seth Rogen himself. The ad parodied the famous Walt Disney spot. Number 106. As with most big animated pictures, the premiere date has been changed several times. Originally, production was aiming for 2015, but that changed to the following year. Then they announced early June for the release date to be pushed back another two months. Number 107. Sausage Party officially premieres with the release date set for August 12th. It will be competing with the release of the new Pete's Dragon remake, which is slated to premiere the exact same day. They're going for a summer blockbuster release, which is unheard of for most R-rated pictures. And those are 107 facts you should know about Sausage Party. Hit that subscribe button for more 107 facts, and if you want us to do 107 on your favorite show, let us know in the comments down below.